glad you are back here with us and welcome everyone. Glad you're here this morning. Why don't we pray before we get into our message and then we'll get into our message. I'm sure with you some exciting things today. Father, we thank you in Jesus name for your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us into all of your truth. And Lord, as we come to study this morning, we look to you to open our eyes, to open our ears. We come into your presence to sit at your feet, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord, for teaching us your ways, showing us your paths, giving us your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open with me to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew, the 19th chapter. And we're going to look at verse 3. And we're still on the series of keeping it in context. We've been talking about divorce and remarriage. I do believe that this is the last message I will be doing on this. And we're going to move on to something else from here. But in verse 3, it says, The Pharisees also came to him, meaning Jesus, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. I heard a story one time about a guy who was flying on a plane, and he was sitting next to another gentleman. And they're flying together, and they're just talking about life and talking about what they do. You know how you fly on a plane, somebody goes, well, what do you do, and where are you going? So they're talking back and forth. And one of the guys who was talking, he noticed that the other guy that he was talking to, he had on a wedding ring. But what he noticed was that his wedding ring was on the wrong hand. And his wedding ring was not only on the wrong hand, but it was on the wrong finger of the wrong hand. And he was curious about this, and they kept talking, and finally he couldn't stand it any longer, and he said, can I ask you a question? Because he said, this is just bugging me. He goes, yeah, what is it? He says, you're married, right? He goes, yeah. He goes, well, I noticed that you've got your wedding ring on the wrong hand and on the wrong finger. He goes, yeah. He goes, well, can I ask you, why do you have your wedding ring on the wrong hand, on the wrong finger. And the guy said, because I married the wrong woman. (laughs) Now, the reason I tell you that, I know some of you look at me and go, oh, that's horrible. (laughs) But the reason I say that, it's a joke, but it really has to deal with this verse here, especially verse 6, where it says, so then they that are, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, this is the phrase, what God has joined together, let not man separate. As I've been doing this series on keeping it in context, we've been talking about divorce and remarriage and its biblical context. One of the things that I've been getting, and one of the things that's been happening is people contact me on Facebook, because we're broadcasting this on Facebook. People let me know that it's helping to them. I've been getting words like, you know, this is revolution. This is uh, revolutionary. Thank you so much. It's really helping me. It's set me free. And, what, and people have been asking me questions behind the scenes. They, they'll contact me on Facebook Messenger. And so one of the questions I was asked by one of the viewers was, what do you do? How do you know if God has joined you to the person that you're married to versus you have joined yourself? In other words, did God really join us together or have we simply joined ourselves together? And they asked me, they said, are you going to cover that? And I thought, that's a good question. It's a really good question. I told them, yeah, I, I was going to answer them back. They, they asked it as a question. I was going to respond back. And as I thought about it, I went, you know, I think I'll just do a whole teaching on this. Because I think it's a great question. And when I got the question, I sat down over a week, about two weeks ago, and I began thinking about what exactly does this question mean? Now, the person who, who sent me the question just asked me the question, but I started thinking about the implications of this question. Is it that when it says what God has brought together, let no man, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder, does this mean that sometimes we join ourselves and God didn't join us? Does that happen? And if so, what do we do? This is the question. If that happens, then what do we do? And so as I thought about this, um, I thought about, I want to talk about this, 
And if you remember last week, we talked about the phrase where the Apostle Paul said that if a unbelieving spouse leaves a believing spouse, then that person, the believing spouse, is no longer under bondage, meaning that they're free to remarry in its, in its original context. And he says, for God has called us to peace. We talked about the phrase, God has called us to peace, at the very end of my message last week. We said that that phrase really is a Jewish idiom, a talk, according to Dr. David Instone Brewer, and it has to deal with dealing with complex situations, sometimes legal situations that can be complex, but dealing with it in a practical way. Not getting into all the complexity, not making it difficult, but dealing with things that maybe are not, uh, it, it, we have the ideal, but you've got to deal with things in a practical manner. So when it says God has called us to peace, this is a phrase that was used in Judaism you know, for the sake of peace, for the sake of order. It was dealing with situations that can be a little bit complex, but you deal with them in a very practical way. You deal with them in almost a common sense way. Today, I want to deal with this issue of does God join us together with people or is it some, or versus, does God, does God join us together versus do we join ourselves to people and therefore maybe that's why we have problems? That's what I want to deal with today. There are three assumptions that I want to deal with because as I thought about it, what came to my mind is three assumptions that people can have in their mind in asking this question. Now for the person who sent me the question, they may not have had these assumptions, but I know in working with people over the years, talking with people, coaching people, counseling people as a pastor, these type of questions come up. Assumption number one is, if God joined us together versus we join ourselves together, then our marriage will succeed. This is what some people think. If God has joined us together and we didn't join ourselves together, in other words, if I marry the person that God wants me to marry, if I marry the one, we are going to succeed. We will stay together we're going to have a great marriage. We won't get a divorce. That's assumption number one. Assumption number two, what God has joined together means you are to be led by God to the right person. You've got to let God lead you. you. You need to know. You must know. If you're going to marry somebody, you must know that God has told you to marry that person. You need to get a clear word from God that, yep, this is is the one. That's assumption number two. If we're talking about God bringing us together, you must know that God is saying, this is the person you must marry. You've got to get a clear word from God. This is the person. Here's the silent assumption number three. If we're having problems in our marriage, this may mean that I married the wrong person. If I'm having problems, if things are not working out, this could mean I married the wrong person. Or if we divorce, this means that probably God never told us to get married in the first place. If we end up in divorce, this probably means because why would God put me with someone and then we end up getting a divorce? So it could be that maybe, maybe if you don't think this to yourself, somebody might tell you, maybe you didn't marry the right person because why would God put you with someone where you only end up being divorced later. Those are the three assumptions that we're going to be dealing with in this phrase, what God has joined together. First of all, I want to ask the question, are there people that are not God's will for us to marry? The answer to that is yes. There are people, God, that he does not want us to marry. God told Israel, that they were to not marry certain people. Turn to Deuteronomy in your Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. There were certain people that, the, that God told Israel, his people, that they were not to marry. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, we're going to look at verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1. Deuteronomy 7, 1 says, When the Lord brings you into the land, which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the, per the Perizzites, the Hitv Hitvites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them, nor shall you make marriage with them. 
You shall not give your daughters to their son, nor take their daughters for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. So one of the things we see immediately from this passage, one of the groups of people that God says that Israel was not to marry with, they were not to intermarry with, other, with the peoples of other nations. They were not to intermarry with peoples of other nations. Now, this had nothing to do with race. There are some people who have tried to make this about race. There are some people who have even used this in the past to say, well, see, the races should not mix. This is not what this passage is talking about. This has nothing to do with race. Because back in those days, if you put certain people from the Middle East together, you couldn't tell if they were an Israelite. You couldn't tell if they were a Canaanite because they looked the same. A lot of them looked the same. You could not tell. And back then, they didn't judge you on the basis of the color of your skin. They wanted to know where you were from. They don't care. They didn't care about the color of your skin. Where are you from? What tribe are you from? What clan are you a part of? And if you are part of my tribe and you are part of my clan and you've got a different color skin, if for whatever reason you had a different color skin, that didn't matter because you were a part of my people. So it simply did not matter. So this wasn't about race. This was really about faith. This had to do about, this was more of a spiritual religious, religious issue. It had to do with Israel remaining faithful and loyal to God. So they were told, don't intermarry with the peoples of other nations because it could lead you away from serving God. It could lead you away from your loyalty to God. But we have to remember that the other nations served other gods. They, Israel lived in a time like we do now, a time of plurality. Other nations worship, Israel worshiped only one God. The other nations worship a plurality of gods. They worship many gods. And so they had religious, what we could call pagan practices that was involved in the worship of other gods. Things that God said to Israel, these things are an abomination to me, and because of these things, I have driven the nation out of the land. Don't you do them. And so God said to Israel, listen, I don't want you intermarrying with these other people because if you do, you will get seduced. And you will end up doing the same practices. You will end up doing the same rituals. You will end up doing the same things that I consider the, an abomination. And I'll end up driving you out of the land. And this, this would happen to Israel. But, God, but this was for the purpose of keeping Israel safe, keeping them from the idol, idolatrous practices of other nations. God did not want them serving other gods. He wanted them to serve him and him alone. Now, we are taught basically the same thing. We're exhorted to this in the New Testament. If you look on your handout, we got here second, on page 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 and 16 says this. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Notice that. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. So here we're clearly told in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that we as believers, as those following Christ, we're not to be joined to those who are not of our faith. We're not to enter into the same type of practices that are contrary. Now, this is, does not mean you can't talk to somebody who's not a Christian. This is not what this is talking about. This, mean, this does not mean you can't work with somebody that's not a Christian. He's talking about that you enter into the same practices, the same way of life that they're entering into that God says is contrary to his will. And this also applies to people that we marry, that we're not to be unequally yoked to people who don't share our same faith. So what Paul is quoting here, what Paul is stating here is a principle that we get and that we've just seen in the Old Testament, in the Torah, about not being unequally yoked. If you look here in your handout again, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. Now again, this is not about discrimination. This is not about, I don't like you. It is simply a matter of faith. We are committed to the Lord. We walk with him. So we have to be walking with people, in fellowship with people, married to people. This is the will of God, who have the same type 
of faith. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, we read this last week, Paul said, a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes. Notice this, only in the Lord. If a woman has a husband who dies and she becomes a widow, Paul says she can marry whomever she wants. It just needs to be in the Lord. She is free to marry anyone. It just needs to be in the Lord. This is very similar uh, to what was written in Jewish divorce certificates where a woman was told in the divorce certificate, once she divorced, she was told, you are free to marry anyone you wish. You can marry anyone that you wish. And some certificates, it was even more specific. They would say you can marry any Jewish man that you wish. So they were very specific. You can marry whomever you want. If you were Jewish, you just need to marry someone who's Jewish. If you divorce and you wanted to remarry, you were fine to remarry, as we've covered in past sessions. However, you could only remarry someone who was also Jewish. You were not supposed to marry outside of the faith. If you were a believer, a Christian, a believer in Yeshua in the first century, and the same thing applied, if, you got, if your spouse left you, if they divorced you, you were free to remarry, or if your spouse died, you were free to remarry whomever you wish as long as they are in the Lord. Same thing what God said in Deuteronomy 7, same thing what he said to the Jewish people, he said to those who were believers in Jesus. So Paul utilizes the same Principle. Now, again, this was to avoid the danger of moving away from your loyalty to the Lord. That was the purpose of this. It's not that God was a, a killjoy. It wasn't that God was trying to keep people from being happy. He was saying, listen, I want to secure your love and your loyalty to me. Even in the first century, in Jesus' world, there were still people who were worshiping other gods. They were living in a Greco-Roman world, and they worshiped, again, a plurality of gods. You even had household gods. And so usually if you married a man and he was not Jewish, he was pagan. And basically from a Jewish perspective, there are two types of people in the world. There's Jews and everybody else. <laughs> and so if you were Jewish, excuse me, if, if you were not Jewish, you were probably a pagan, meaning you were not Jewish. And so therefore you worshiped other gods. You were a goyim, you were a Gentile. You worshiped other gods. So if you married someone, who was not Jewish, you were, you were marrying someone who was worshiping other gods. And I can tell you, some of those worships, when you start to study what they did in the worship of other gods, it, it, gets, it gets pretty decadent. It gets pretty, for lack of a better term, it gets pretty nasty. It, it, just, it gets bad, the way they would go about their rituals of worship. And so God was saying through Paul, listen, I want you to stay away from that which will contaminate your faith, which will cause you to move away from me, okay? Now, this idea that if we marry outside of the faith and we end up marrying someone who's not part of the faith, that it can move us away, we see this exemplified in the life of Solomon. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. This idea that we need to safeguard ourselves 1 Kings chapter 11. I remember in talking about this. Well, I'll, I'll read this first, then we'll show the illustration here. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites. These are people that God said, do not marry. From the nations of whom the Lord has said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you, surely they will turn your heart. Notice this, surely they will turn your hearts after their God. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God as was the heart of his father David. So here we see exemplified in Solomon the very thing that God said would happen. And he, Solomon is considered the wisest man in the Bible, the wisest man in the Hebrew scriptures. He is the wisest man in the world. And yet even this very wise man end up disobeying the very thing that God said, don't do. 
for the reasons that God said. God said, listen, if, if you do this, they're going to turn your heart away from me. They're going to turn away your loyalty from me. And if, especially if Solomon as king, he's the ruler over Israel. If his heart turns away from the Lord, that endangers the rest of Israel. There's a saying in, I believe it's it, it, in Malachi or, or Habakkuk, one of, or, or um, I think it's in Malachi. But it's, it's, there's a saying that says, like priests, like people. Or we could paraphrase that, as the ruler is, so the people will be. If Solomon is, is going after other gods and he begins to worship other gods, it puts the entire nation in a position where they're going to follow what the king is doing, which means they break covenant with God, which means the blessing of God upon the nation stops flowing. It puts the nation at risk. It puts the nation in danger. God was trying to protect the people of Israel so they could stay in a place where they experience his goodness. This is why God said, do not worship outside of the faith. I'm excuse me, do not marry outside of the faith. It's not that I don't love other people. It's not that, that, uh, that, that well, it's not that I don't love them. I'll put it like that. God said, listen, don't do it because it'll put you in a position when you no longer experience my grace, my favor in your life. Because you will move away from me. You'll break covenant with me. You will end up choosing death rather than choosing life. I remember when I was 14 years old, I met this young lady. I had just gotten saved that year. It was 1979, going into 1980. And I met this young lady. And she just, to me, at the time, she was like just the cutest little thing. And I liked her, but she was not a Christian. And I thought she liked me. Actually, I found out later on she was trying to get next to me to get next to a friend of mine. But I really liked her. But I knew what the Bible said about being unequally yoked. Now, I wasn't going to get married, but I knew it's like, this is not a good idea. And I could see God was trying to protect me. But I tell you, you know how it says it'll turn your heart away? I literally said to God one day, about 15 years old, and I was kind of frustrated, and I really liked this girl, and I wanted her to like me. And I said to God, Lord, you're doing this wrong. Let me handle this, and I'll get her saved. Now, I look back on it now, and I think to myself, what was wrong with me? <laughs> what was wrong with my head that I'm at 15 telling God you're handling this wrong? Because, God, you need to get her. Because I, I tried to give her tracks and stuff. And, and it was my, my I, I had wrong reasons for trying to get her saved. But I was like, God, let me do it. And it like to mess me up. And I didn't do anything wrong. We didn't do anything wrong. But I remember just feeling down and depressed because, I, you know. And it was my heart for a brief moment was being moved away, trying to hook up with somebody who was not in the faith. So I experienced a little bit. I remember I told God later, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. I, I wonder if God kind of said, you know what? Let him go on a little bit by himself. Just a little bit. Let, let's give him enough rope so he can see that, no, 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 you do not tell me. I'm handling Because I literally said, you're not handling this right. Let me do this. This is what can happen when we put ourselves in a position, when we start to, when we start to go down a road that God says, do not go down this road. We have ministered to people who... And I'm talking about Karen and I, where they wanted to hook up with people. And we're like, don't do it. Don't do it. And one of the things, Karen and I were talking about this the other day. We were saying, one of the things that we do not like to have to deal with is what I call matters of the heart or affairs of the heart. Especially with friends. Because I'm like, oh. Because people don't like telling you. They don't like being told. I don't, I don't know if you should do this. I had a friend of mine one time who called me. And I had heard that she was getting married. And she called me and said, hey, have you heard? I'm getting married. I said, yeah, I heard. That's all I said. Because I knew the circumstances around this. I didn't think they were too great. Or I didn't think they were great at all. Because she had only known this person for a month. And so she said, yeah, I'm getting married. I said, yeah, and I, I was like, I'm not, if she don't ask me, I'm not saying anything. So I, didn't, I, we were on the phone, I was quiet, I didn't say anything, and then she finally went, so uh, 
What do you think about that? And then my brain went, glad you asked. <laughs> and I said to her, don't you think that's a little fast? You just, you've only known this person for a month. Oh, no, 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 but Mike, 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 you don't understand. I, they, they, they go to church. They're a wonderful person. This is the best person I could be with. Mike, you just don't, you don't understand. This is really a great relationship. You, you just got to meet them. I said, but you don't know them. No, 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 I know them. They picked me up. We go to church. I said, you don't really know them. You've only known them for a month. So I used this illustration. I said, it's like being far away from someone. You see them at a distance. And at a distance, you think they look great. At a distance, you think they look wonderful until you get up close and then you start seeing all the flaws. You start seeing all the things that are wrong. You see the acne. You see the pox. You start seeing all, you see the yellow teeth. You start seeing all the stuff that you cannot see far away. But once you get up close, once you get closer, once you really get to know them, then you really get to see them. So I said to her, not don't get married. I said, I think you should wait. Wait, get to know them a little bit better before you marry them. I didn't know what she was going to do. She just went, okay. I didn't know if she was going to wait or not. Heard from her a few months later, she didn't get married. She told me, she said, ooh, I'm so glad I didn't marry him. Come to find out, he wasn't really saved at all. He was just going to church trying to pick up girls. I was like, glad you didn't do that. She could have ended up in a worse situation. We've had friends of ours who were close to the Lord, on, on fire for God. I'm thinking about one friend of mine in particular, was on fire for God, hooked up with someone who was not a believer, started sleeping with them, and turned away for a period of time from their faith. Their hearts moved away from the Lord. And I remember, I think they said something to Karen and I to the effect of, I don't care, I'm going I'm to do what I want to do. I was like, and I introduced Karen to this person because when I had known her, she was serving the Lord. I said, oh, you're going to love her, man. She's on fire for God. And we're, we're like, I'm like, what happened? She had had some hurts and stuff in her life. This guy came along and made her feel good, and she got seduced into the relationship and ended up moving away from God. When we end up in relationships, and when people try to talk to her, I tried to talk to her, she didn't want to hear it. When we move into relationships that are contrary to the will of God, there are some people that God says, I don't want you to hook up with. I don't want you to be joined to. I don't want you to be yoked to. We see this, what happened in Solomon. Now, the thing with Solomon is it points us to something else that's very important, to help us to determine and to discern whether or not we should be with a particular person. Is this somebody that God wants me to be with? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17. See, Solomon should have known better. Solomon was the king of Israel, and God gave kings certain principles that they were supposed to live by that would keep them safe, that would keep them on the right path. Deuteronomy chapter uh, uh, 17, verse 14. Verse 14 says, When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around me. Now notice this. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. Now I want you to remember this because this is going to be important later. Israel said, I mean, God, Moses told Israel, there's going to come a time when you are going to want a king like the other nations. That did happen. And God said, yeah, you're going to set a king over yourself, but it's the king that I choose. Keep that in mind. The king that I choose. Keep that in mind. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he, the one that set over you, the king, shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wise for himself, lest his heart turn away nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. And it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, notice this, he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the ones before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. 
that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandments to the right hand or to the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So one of the things that kings were to do to protect their reign, to protect their prosperity. God says, I want you, and Karen talks about this verse all the time, you are to write for yourself, you are to write for yourself a scroll of the law, and you're to keep it by you so that you may read it all the days of your life so you will observe what is in it so that you can do it, so that you can preserve your kingdom, preserve the blessing over the, over the land of Israel as king. So they were supposed to be constantly reading kings. The leaders of Israel were to be constantly reading and studying the Torah. They were to look into the Torah to know what is the will of God. They were to look into the Torah to glean from it the wisdom of God. And, he, and God said, it is so that your heart does not turn away from me. And this is precisely what we see happening with Solomon, the wisest of all men. But here's the lesson we can take from this. The written word of God, when we ask the question, how do I know if, I have, if God has joined us together or if I have simply joined myself? One of the things we need to look to is the written word of God. It's one of the ways that we discern and we know if God has sanctioned our marriage. The spirit of God, the word of God, and the wisdom of God will agree. God will never have you do anything that is contrary to his will. Solomon was the wisest man in Scripture, but he was not operating in the wisdom of God because if he had been operating in the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God would have directed him back to the Word of God, the written Word of God, the Torah, which says, Solomon, you are not supposed to join yourself to women of pagan nations. Solomon, you're not to multiply horses. Solomon, you're not to multiply gold. You know, all these things Solomon did. He stopped operating in the wisdom of God. But had he stayed in the word of God, his wisdom would have been uncontaminated. His mind would have been directed to the way of God and the will of God. And he would have preserved his kingdom. The kingdom during Solomon's reign, or just right after he, he died, it was split. The ten northern tribes were taken from him. And God said, this is judgment. He said, I'm going to leave you one because of my promise to your father David. But I'm going to give the rest to another person. This is where we get the northern tribe and the southern tribe. The northern tribe is composed of the ten tribes, the southern tribe composed, of, which was Judah. And it was, it was a problem. It was all because Solomon departed from the written will of God. Now, why do I say that? Because a lot of times when it comes to matters of the heart, when it comes to the affairs of the heart, and somebody wants to be with somebody, all of a sudden, everybody can become real spiritually sensitive. I know what the Lord told me. <laughs> I know what God said. I can hear from God too. Karen, have we heard that from people? <laughs> I can hear from God. You're not the only one that can hear from God. I'm like, but it's not biblical. It's not scriptural. Or wisdom will say, you're moving too fast. Slow down. And the usually it's because people feel a certain way. So this is why we're talking about this, because one of the ways we can know, are we on track or not, is, is it me joining myself to somebody, or is God joining us together? We have to look at, are we operating according to his will, as revealed in his word? There's kind of a move today to almost where people are kind of putting down the written word of God, like it's not something you can rely upon and live by. No. We can live by this. We have to study it carefully. We have to study it with wisdom, listening to the Spirit of God, applying all the tools that we can. That's why we're talking about keeping it in context so we can hear what God has said in its proper context so that we can hear what God is saying to us in our context. Does that make sense? So we've got to study. So if we take this phrase, what God has joined together, if we take it to mean God has brought us together or he has led us together to be married Therefore, it's his will for us to be married. If, if I take the, the phrase, what God has joined together, if I take it to mean, this means that God has led us together, and if God has led us together, then God want us, wants us to be together, then we would have to say that to marry an unbeliever 
when you are already a believer, to marry an unbeliever when you're already a believer is contrary to the will of God. To marry a believer, an unbeliever, when you are already a believer, you've become a believer, and then you meet someone, if we marry them, man or, you know, if I'm, if I'm a guy, if I wasn't married to Karen, and she was saved, and then she meets me and I'm not saved, and she goes, but he's just so cute. I'm just checking to make sure she's not shaking her head. <laughs> and she marries me, and I'm not saved. She would be out of the will of God. So in that sense, God did not bring us together. I've heard people say, oh, but it was the will of God for us. I'm going, but it's not biblical. It's not scriptural. Yeah, but the Spirit left me. The Holy Spirit is not going to lead you to do what is contrary to the will of God. So in that sense, if I'm marrying someone who is not saved and I am saved, in that sense, God did not lead us to do that because that person is, is, is contrary to the principle of Scripture, do not marry outside of your, of your faith. If I do that, that could lead me to move away from God and loyalty to him. So God is not going to go against his own will in leading us to marry someone not of the same faith. And this is the reason why Dr. Joe... M. Sprinkle, I have his quote here. He wrote a book called Biblical Law and Its Relevance. This is what he said, and this is why. He said, for very, pra for, for very practical reasons, such a marriage is harmful. A marriage, if you're a believer and you marry someone who's a non-believer, he said, this type of marriage is harmful. It sets a poor example for children. It limits what believers can do and may undermine their spiritual life, and it puts a strain on the marriage. And it puts a strain, if it's putting a strain on the marriage, it's putting a strain on the people in the marriage. And I'm just talking about when you are married to someone who is not saved and you are saved and you marry a person who's not saved. I'm not even talking about if you are married, you are a believer, you are saved, and you married to somebody who say they saved, but they're not living like they saved. Because that puts a strain on the marriage too. And that's also, you're still unequally yoked in the sense that you're not living by the same values. And this is why it can be detrimental to you, to your spiritual life, to your mental and emotional health. I have been there and working with people, and I've said to people, and I've, well, sometimes I've said to them, sometimes I just thought, of, why did you marry this person? And you knew they were not a believer. You knew that they did not have the same value. You knew that you and, and he or you and she were not walking the same path because that becomes the problem. If you are married to somebody, if you're saved, you marry somebody who's not saved, what ends up happening is you are now joined with somebody who has different values. You are joined to somebody who has different beliefs. You are joined to someone who has a different worldview. And you are going to be, you're going to end up going in different directions. And that's what creates the strain. Because it's like if I was to take a rope and tie it to my hand, and then I take a rope and tie it to your hand, now we're joined together. We got to walk together. But you decide you want to go east, and I said, no, we're going west, and we're both pulling. That creates strain. Because we're not moving in the same direction. It creates stress. That creates arguments. And many times people suffer because of being in that type of relationship. They suffer in many, in, in many different ways. Now, Karen and I, we, we've ministered to them. So this is one of the reasons we're talking about this. So here's the other question. So, Mike, you say, okay, so if I'm married to an unbeliever, do I divorce them? Not so quick. <laughs> you just don't go, oh, and I don't want anybody to listen to this bishop go like, oh, I wasn't supposed to be married? Okay, let me go get my spouse. Bye. <laughs> Now, this may where you may need to get some counseling. You may need to get some help. This is Paul's point in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12 through 14. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 again. You just don't divorce if you have, quote, made that mistake. I've had people tell me, but I thought it was going to be different. There are people who think, you know, if we get married, they'll change. Or if we get married, I will change them. No, <laughs> there is no guarantee that they will change and there's no guarantee you can change them. Paul actually speaks to this. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse 12. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife, 
who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce. So if your spouse wants to stay, stay together. A woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, for God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? And the answer is, you don't. So either way, stay with them, they might get saved. Now the idea of staying with them is not that you stay together miserable. Paul says, he's talking about, again, that principle of for the sake of peace. You get counseling, you do what you can, you do everything you can to create a harmonious home. Hopefully that person will work with you to create a harmonious home. If not, then there are grounds for divorce. If the person is being cruel, if they're cheating on you, and they refuse to change, they abandon you, there are grounds for divorce. But if that's not happening, it's just a matter of we're not getting along, then I, I always tell people, get counseling. Find someone who can work with you to help you to forge peace. Judaism is called shalom bayit, the peace of the household. A harmonious household. Find people who are good at helping you to create that. I have a friend now, uh, she, she had been married once before, she got divorced, she married again, and I think within the context of that, she became a believer, but her husband presently is not a believer. But she does her best to create a harmonious household. She's operating as a believer, her present husband currently is not, but she's doing the best that she can, that she knows how to create harmony within her household. So it is possible. It is possible. But the original principle here that we're looking at is that we don't want to create an unnecessary situation. So if you are saved, and I'm talking to people here also on Facebook, and you meet someone, I don't care how good they look, how sweet they smell, <laughs> how much money they may have, how sweet they talk to you, please do not join yourself to that person because it may be fun for a moment, but usually there's a price to pay. Are there exceptions to the rule? Yes. There are exceptions to the rule. But you don't know if you are going to be that exception to the rule. Does that make sense? So that's one thing I wanted to deal with here. So can we marry people that God says that he, that's not our will? Yeah. Can we join ourselves? Yes. Does that mean we should immediately get a divorce? No. We should work on it and seek to create a harmonious household, do everything that we can do. Now, does God lead us or tell us to marry a certain person? Can God lead us to do that? Yes, he can, and he does do that. Number one, we see in the Bible, God brought Eve to Adam. God led the very first man and woman. He brought them together. Uh, in Genesis chapter 24, go over to Genesis chapter 24. God led Abraham's servants to the woman, Rebekah, that the servant was looking a wife for Abraham's son Isaac, he led the servant to Rebekah. So go to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. We're going to just look at this real quick. In Genesis chapter 24, look at verse 1. Genesis 24, verse 1. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house who ruled over all that he had, Please, place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from among the daughter of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. All right, now look at verse um, 7. Verse 7. Or we'll go to verse 6. But Abraham said, Beware that you do not take my son back there, the Lord of, of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your descendants I give this land. Notice this. He will send his angel before you, he shall, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. 
Look at verse 26. This is after his servant has traveled. He comes to a certain place. He meets Re- uh, Rebecca and it says, Then the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. So this young woman ran and told her mother, her mother's household, these things. One more verse. Look at verse 48. Again, Abraham's servant is speaking. He said, I bowed my head and I worshiped the Lord and I blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham who led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. So what we see, and the reason I read all this is just to emphasize the point, Abraham's servant was led by God to find a wife for Isaac. He was led by God. So God can and God does lead people to their spouses. God led Karen and I together. He led us together. Karen was in living in Colorado. I'm originally from Indiana. We both ended up in Los Angeles at my aunt's house. Karen was originally doing some work for her church. They were doing this project. They said, we need somebody to volunteer for this aspect of the project. No one volunteered. Karen said, I'll do it. I think there was an angel there saying, Karen, Karen, thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> so Karen volunteered. As a result, she ended up, as part of the project, contacting my aunt and a friend of ours. She was over at the house talking with them, talking with my aunt, or talking with our friend. I walk in. My friend said, as I'm walking to the, I said, hi, I saw her sitting there wearing a white blouse, blue skirt, Hair in a bun. Yes, I do remember. <laughs> I'm walking to the back, and our friend Helen said, Michael, come, come here for a minute. Because when I walked in, I didn't, you know, I just said hi and kept walking. She said, I want you to meet Karen. And we were introduced. And we sat in that room, and we talked until it got dark. And that's how we met. We were led together. I had been praying about being married. I believe that when I was 18 years old, the Lord spoke to my heart when I was 18. At this time, I was 20, getting ready to turn 21. He said, you need to start getting ready for marriage. And he started ministering to me. I didn't know, I didn't have any prospects at the time that I knew of. <laughs> I mean, it, nobody was looking for me, so I found out that there was somebody actually they said, no, there were girls that liked you. I said, well, I didn't know it. Nobody said anything to me. I, I found out later on my mom, because I was, I was very focused on ministry. I was very focused on my call, what I was going to do. My mom and my, my aunt were running interference. <laughs> they were keeping people from me. I didn't know that till later. And then, and so here's the thing. As I'm sitting there that, that, that morning, or that, that afternoon talking to Karen, it was on a Saturday, sitting there talking to her. And I thought to myself, I wonder if she's the one. And I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart and said, this is your wife. But I used to ask God the question. I'd meet a, a young lady and I'd go, God, she the one, she the one, she the one, she the one, God, she the one, God, she the one. And I feel like the Lord one time said, Michael, quit asking me that. So I stopped. So when I hear she's the one, I went, no, nah, that's the devil. <laughs> my friend Helen goes upstairs to my mom, who's, who's upstairs, and said, I think that's Michael's wife. My mother has often heard that from people trying to hook me up. She's like, okay, somebody is trying to hook up my son. She comes downstairs. She sees Karen. And my mother tells me later, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, that's Michael's wife. Karen is sitting there. We're talking. And she looks at me and thinks to herself, I hope this guy don't start liking me. <laughs> I was telling her, you can see it. <laughs> but no, she, she, Karen was, you know, very beautiful. Guys liked her. But we started off as friends. My point is that God led us together. And there's a lot more to the story. But God led us together. So does God lead people together? Yes, he does do that. I believe that with all of my heart that God can lead people together. But here's the thing. While God can lead us to our spouses, nowhere in the biblical text, and this goes to one of the assumptions here, that you've got to get a word from God. You've got to hear clearly. Nowhere in the Bible are we told you must get a specific word from God before you can marry someone. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Nowhere in the Bible are we told that that's the rule. 
In other words, that God has to tell you specifically to marry someone or else if he doesn't tell you specifically, then God hasn't led you to that person. The marriage is not joined by God. Joined, you're not joined together by God and you're not blessed. Nowhere in the Bible are we told you've got to hear a specific word. The reason I shared that with you about me and Karen is because while that can happen, I want you to know there's no rule that said it has to happen that way. There's no rule that says it has, that God can move in that way, yes, but there's no rule in the scripture that says that's the way it has to happen. What the Bible does show us is that God can and, do, and God does lead us to our spouses. But we don't want to read into the examples, and we can multiply examples when God has led people together. We don't want to read into that. Well, see, you got to hear from God. you got to get a specific word from God because the Bible never tells us that. It just shows us, listen, God's at work bringing people together. That is the thing that we can say with confidence. He is at work to bring people together. This is why I'm bringing this up about that there is no specific verse that says you must get a specific word from God. This is how it works. In the ancient biblical world, before the time of Jesus, like in the time of Abraham, during the time of Jesus, marriage, for the most part, was arranged by the father of the household. These marriages were arranged marriages. Matter of fact, according to the social role of, of ancient Israel by Victor Matthews and Don Benjamin, they said this, men and women themselves rarely chose their own sexual partners or their marriage partners. It was the father of the household who was responsible for safeguarding the status of the men and the women in the household and then deciding if they were eligible for marriage. So you didn't have people saying, you, in other words, you didn't have, like, I got three daughters. If we lived in ancient times, I would be the one who decides who they're going to marry. Marriage was not so much a romantic thing like we have it today as it was a business transaction. There was negotiations that would go on. And if we were living in biblical days, if, if when Karen and I got married, if we were living in biblical days, the way it would work, my father would negotiate with her father. They would talk about the dowry, how much she's going to be bringing. They would talk about where she's going to live and what I'm going to bring. We would really have no say-so. The fathers would arrange everything. I may not even see Karen until the day of the wedding. So that you didn't have sons and daughters going saying, God, show me who my spouse is going to be. Speak to me, God. Lead me. They had nothing, for the most part, nothing to do with it. This is why, really, you don't see that. Because it wasn't the, it wasn't the young man, the young woman who wanted to get married. They were not the deciding factors. It was the fathers. This is why in the book of Corinthians, Paul even says, fathers, if you decide to keep your virgins, meaning you're not going to marry them off, they're going to live with you. Sometimes that happens. Now, to, the, a, a, a young lady might say, I want to marry him. <laughs> and if the father loved his daughter, he might call it off. But if he said, no, you're going to marry him, they had to marry Taylor, aren't you glad we don't do that nowadays? Because <laughs> in biblical days, I'd be picking her husband. That's the way that it worked. Marriage was, as the book, uh, the social world of ancient Israel, they said marriage was a negotiation between two fathers of a household. It was a negotiation. So as a rule, young men, young women did not have a say. They were not saying, God, show me who my spouse is, or God, is this the person I'm supposed to marry? They didn't have a say so where that was concerned. So, the story, if you think about the story we just read in Genesis chapter 24, that story is not Isaac asking God to show him who his wife is. That story in Genesis 24 is not Isaac saying, God, lead me to my wife. That story is not Isaac saying, God, is Rebecca my wife? That story is Abraham, the father of the household, sending out his servant. We don't even read where Abraham went to Isaac and say, so what are you looking for in a wife? <laughs> it's Abraham saying, go out there, not among the Canaanites, go back to my homeland, find my family, and find, me a, uh, find a wife for my son in my family. Isaac had no say-so. Rebecca really didn't have any say-so. It was the fathers who decided all of this. So again, my point here is that the Bible is not, does not say you must get a specific word from God in order to know that you're 
to marry someone. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible shows us that God leads people and the Bible can, and, the, and God can speak to you. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm saying it is not a rule. It's not a rule. Their marriages in the, in the biblical days were arranged. So they were not asking for a specific word from God to know who they should marry because for the most part, again, it was out of their hands. They would ask God to lead like the, the servant of Abraham said, God, lead me. God led him. He led him. We can ask that today. God, lead me. He might give you a specific word. He might not. I'm not saying it won't happen, but he will lead you and he can lead you. Now, again, saying that God doesn't speak a, a specific word, it doesn't mean that God's not involved. He is involved. And this is the thing I think it's so important for us to understand. For those people who want to get married, God is involved. In Jewish tradition, not only are earthly fathers involved in arranging marriages, but God, the heavenly father, is involved in arranging marriages. In Jewish tradition, one of the things that's taught us, and I, and I love this saying, it said, first of all, it says, 40 days before the formation of a child in the womb, a bat kol announces, this person is to marry so-and-so's daughter. A bat, a bat kol, the word bat means daughter, kol means voice, it's the daughter voice. This is a supernatural voice that would speak from out of the heavens to announce something. This is known in Judaism. You actually see this in the Bible. Remember when Jesus got baptized and it said a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In Judaism, that is known as a bat kol. Remember when Jesus was with the disciples and they were on the mountain, and Moses and Elijah appeared. Then it said, a voice spoke, said, this is my son, hear ye him. That, a bat kol. There was another time a voice spoke, and the people, and everybody said they thought it thundered. That's a bat kol. So this is well known within Judaism. We see it within the Gospels. So one of the Jewish traditions is, when a 40 days before a child is formed in the womb, a voice goes forth from heaven saying, this child is to marry so-and-so's daughter. What's the idea? Heaven is involved in bringing, God is involved in bringing people together. Another tradition says this, this is one of my favorite ones. A Roman lady asked the rabbi, how many days did the Holy One, blessed be he, create the universe? How, how many days did it take him? In six days, he answered. And though she asked the question, so what, is been, what has he been doing since then up to this present? The rabbi answered, he's been arranging marriages. <laughs> now, this is Jewish tradition. The idea behind this the, the, these uh, Haggadah, these, these Midrashim, it's not to say this is actually what's happening. It's to, get, it's to point to the idea that God is involved in bringing people together. He's involved in that. Now, oh, by the way, the rabbis also taught that creating, God, not only does God bring them together, they taught that creating a successful match, creating a successful marriage is harder than parting the Red Sea. When I read that, I went, ain't that the truth? <laughs> In other words, creating a successful marriage, they recognize it's not easy. It takes work. It's harder work than parting the Red Sea. But they believe that God was involved. So this teaches us that two people coming together, God's involved, that's the point. And it, can, and it teaches us that whether we get a specific word from God or not, God is already at work to bring his people together in marriage. You may not hear a word. You may not hear a voice. You may not get something specific, or you may not, but know that whether you do or not, and your desire is to be married, God is working to bring you with and to someone. He's working to make that happen. But you don't, so this deals with one of the other assumptions. Do you have to have a specific word from God? Must you know specifically that God is saying this is the person? No, you do not. You do not. It's nice if you do. Now, we're going to talk about some other things that need to go with this. But there is no verse that says you must hear specifically. You must get a specific word. So what can we learn also from Jewish tradition about who to marry? Here's a couple of things. While it is taught that God brings people together, that marriages are divinely arranged, that God is involved, they also teach that the bringing together of people in marriage it's a divine human activity. It's not just a divine activity. It's not just God bringing people together, nor is it just a human activity, people working. It's God and people working together to bring people together. That is so important. 
Because one of the mistakes I think sometimes we make is that we say, well, God's going God's to bring me my husband. So I'm just going to sit back and wait. I'm just going to wait. Well, it's taking God so long. <laughs> I'm waiting. And I've asked people who said, they say, I don't understand why God hasn't brought me a mate yet. I said, well, what have you done to meet someone? What do you mean? Do you go out? No. Do you date? Uh-uh. What do you do? I pray. How's that working for you? <laughs> now, don't misunderstand me. Again, God can simply bring you someone. But if you go back and you read the story of Abraham's servant, he said this. While I was on the way, God led me to this young lady. While he was out there living, while he was out there being obedient, doing what he was supposed to do, it was while he was in activity, God led him. When God said, go find my son, a wife, when Abraham said to his servant, go find my son, a wife, he didn't go home and just pray and then sit at home and wait for God to bring somebody. He went out, yet he acknowledged that it was God who led him. It's a divine human activity. It's co-participation together. Man and God working together. Now, in the past few centuries, within the Jewish community, especially among the Orthodox, they utilize the services of a shatkan, a shatkan, or a matchmaker. I don't know where, to, Karen, where is that song, matchmaker? Is it from Tevye, I mean, from Settler on the Roof? Yeah, matchmaker, matchmaker, find me a match, find me a find, catch me a catch. Love that movie. The shatkan is a matchmaker. This is someone who, for a living, puts people together. But the understanding is that God is involved also. But a shatkan uses objective criteria to match couples together. This is according to Dr. Marvin Wilson in his book, Our Father Abraham, The Jewish Roots of the Christian Faith. A shatkan will use objective criteria. So they're not just going out and just picking anyone. They've got certain criteria that they're looking at when they're looking at potential spouses and putting them together. So they will look at things like your family background, the, the person's reputation in the community, what's their character, are they a person of virtue, what's their level of education, are they able to support this other person. They're using objective criteria. They're not simply sitting back going, I'm going to wait and just hear a word from God till God tells me the person that you're supposed to be with. They, they are checking people out. Trusting that God is at work, trusting that God is leading, trusting that God is guiding, but also utilizing objective criteria to determine whether or not, is this a good match? Now, I have to tell you, at one point, I, I used to think, oh, that's not very spiritual. I've come to realize not only is it very spiritual, it's also very safe <laughs> to have the right criteria. Now, this tells us that marrying another person should be informed by wisdom, not just emotion. Not ruling out emotion, but there needs to be wisdom. When you have objective criteria where you can look and see, hey, is this somebody that I want to marry? Is this somebody I want to be with? If you've got some objective criteria, this can really help. This can really help us out. Because if we're simply going by a subjective feeling of, I feel led, that can create problems. We've had so many people tell us, I feel led to marry this person. This is the person for me. Like I said, I've known people who got married after knowing someone for one month. And the person that they married had only been saved for a couple of months. And they were struggling in their marriage, and their marriage ended up ending. Now, I remember when I sat down with this couple, I said, did you get any type of counseling before you guys got married? And I remember the young man said to me, well, he said, yeah, but I was saved, so I figure I can do all things through Christ, so I can handle this. And I was like, okay. They said, well, he, you know, he, he was saved. I'm going, and I told them, I said, I would have had you wait. I wouldn't have married you. And they're like, you wouldn't have? I went, no. I said, he just became a Christian. He's just finding out what this is all about. He needs time to grow. He needs time to develop. And they actually agreed to that. But unfortunately, the marriage ended up not working out because the young man was, he was young. And it's not that young people can't get married, but he did not have the maturity. He didn't have the development. He, he did not have 
thing that Karen and I look at objectively when people come to us and they go, can you coach us? Can you help us to prepare for marriage? There are objective things that we look for. And like I said last week, we always tell them, we're going to work with you for a certain time. We're going to work with you for a certain period of months. And after we do that, we will give you our opinion. It's our opinion as to whether or not we think you're ready to be married. You can do whatever you want, but I'm going to give you, we're going to give you our opinion to safeguard and make sure that if you are, if you are ready, we're going to make sure you have everything you need to get ready. Make sure your foundation is laid so you can build upon a good foundation. We don't expect them to be perfect, but we do expect a foundation to be laid. And often when people come, honestly, they don't have a foundation. They're not really ready when they first meet with us to get married. But then we start working with them to get them ready to build that foundation. And we look for certain things to let us know that they're ready. There's objective criteria. There's the wisdom that we've gained over being married. There's the wisdom that we've gained in studying and reading about marriage and working with couples. We are told in the Bible to seek wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all you're getting, get understanding. So when it comes to marriage, one of the things we want to do is get some wisdom. We need to look for godly character. We need to look, do this, does this person really love God? Are they virtuous? Do they have a commitment to God? Do they have a commitment to Scripture? Do they have a commitment to living by the Scripture? Are they kind? I look at how do you treat other people? How do you treat your parents? How do you treat your mother? You got sisters, how do you treat it? But I'm only not looking at that. I'm also looking at now, so when you guys leave here, how does he treat you when you're not here? This is one of the reasons I tell people, don't get married fast, wait. Because you want, because, you know, when, whenever we meet people, I mean, how many of you remember, like, the, when, back in the days when, we, you know, you date and stuff, you meet somebody, you always put your best foot forward, Right? We put our best, we show up our best self. You know, we do everything as we're supposed to. We're polite, we're kind, and we're nice. But then if you stay with the person for a while, their real character starts to show up. And if what they are doing is not how they really are, how many of you have ever seen another person come out? How many of you ever thought to yourself, oh, thank you, Jesus, I'm so glad I waited. <laughs> I was like, ooh, Lord. That's why we, one of the reasons I tell people to wait. One of the other reasons I tell them to wait, because I want to see. Because I know when they come with me, they're showing up as their best self. But I want to see after time, because you can only hold that for so long, unless you're a sociopath. <laughs> sometimes you, yeah, sometimes people still get, get tricked. Yep, sometimes, sometimes it happens. And this is why another criteria that you need to have is also, going with what Lisa said, you need to seek godly counsel. Now, listen, let me say this. And I'm glad she said that because I was going to say this. Nothing is perfect. Nothing is perfect. There are times you can do everything you know to do and still, it's like, what did I marry? Who did I hook up with? But you want to minimize that as much as possible. So one of the things that's important when a person is dating, when a person is thinking about being with somebody, you need outside counsel. Because when you are with that person, you're in the moment, you're in your feelings, you're in your emotion, you're filtering everything to those good feelings. You don't see stuff that other people will see. And you really need godly counsel. I mean, people who truly have godly counsel. And even sometimes that can be difficult. Because I've, I've known people who went to other people because they were like, well, we went and got counseling. And I said, well, what did they tell you? They told us it was okay to get married. I'm like, but you only knew one another for a month. They told you it was okay? Yeah, the pastor said, the pastor told you it was okay? After a month? I'm like, oh. <laughs> so sometimes it's difficult to even find the godly counsel. My, my, my standard rule is, when people come out there, how long you know one another? Two, two, two three months? Why, why be in a hurry? <laughs> why not wait a little bit? Spend some time really getting to know one another. Do you really know it? And Karen and I will start asking questions. One of the things I love about Karen when, we, when, when we're together, I, Karen, Karen will ask a question a certain way, and I can always tell when she's getting ready to ask what I call the piercing question because she'll sit back and she won't be saying anything. And she's quiet. And I'm talking, I'm asking a different question. And she'll sit back and she'll lean back 
And then she'll lean forward and go, let me ask you a question. And I go, here it comes. <laughs> and she will ask a question that will just pierce. And all of a sudden, I start seeing people get uncomfortable. And I'm like, there you go. <laughs> because she will surface something that either they were unaware of or they were trying to avoid. This is what I mean by godly counsel. People who just won't go, oh, y'all such a cute couple. Yeah, y'all need to get married. They may be cute. But listen, I tell people all the time, I want you to take your time. I want you to get a good foundation. Because I don't want to see you two months after your wedding. You're coming, can, you, can we meet with you because we're ready to divorce? I said, listen, it's going to be difficult. Even after you get everything, I said, but if you got a good foundation and you're able to build, that's different from going in and you've got no foundation. You don't know how to love. You don't know how to forgive. You don't know how to deal with your own emotions. You, don't know, you haven't dealt with any wounds and hurts of your past. So this is the type of stuff we do when we're working with people. This is the type of stuff we ask. And so you want that godly counsel who's going to go below surface and deal with things in depth. For the purpose of, you know, when, when you build a house, if you're going to build a good foundation, you got to dig deep. You can't stay on the surface or you won't have a good foundation. So you got to dig deep. You want godly counsel who will help you to dig deep so you can lay a good foundation so your marriage will be strong when you build the house of your marriage and the storms come and they will come. And I tell couples all the time, you go right now. It's like, oh, I love you. I love you, too. I love you. I, I said, but one morning you're going to wake up and go. I don't like you. <laughs> well, I, like I don't like you. I don't like your mama. I don't like nothing about you. I said, then what are you going to do? This is where you want to have a good foundation laid so you can build. So let me end this here. If you get godly counsel, if you get godly wisdom, if you looked in the scripture, You've done all the right things. Does it guarantee a successful marriage? And the answer is no. Kind of goes back to what you said before, Lisa. God chose Israel to be his bride. And Israel cheated on God. Remember we read what God said, you're going to ask me, Israel, for kings? And you are going to set a king over you. But it's the king that I choose. God chose Saul to be the first king of Israel. And Saul disobeyed God. He was disloyal. God chose Solomon to be, and God even called Solomon Jedidiah, means the, the Lord loves him. God appeared to Solomon and said, if you follow me, ask me what you want. I'll give you whatever you want. He said, give me wisdom so I know how to rule your people. He said, listen, I'm going to give you wisdom, and if you follow me, I'm going to give you riches, I'm going to give you wealth, and I will establish your kingdom forever. Just follow me and keep my commandment. And as we saw, Solomon turned from God. But God chose Solomon. What's my point? God can bring you together with someone. It doesn't mean they will necessarily stay faithful. It doesn't mean, because the, the, this is what the assumption that I was talking about earlier. If I hear from God, if I'm led of God, if God brings us together, then we're going to have a successful marriage. And it's not necessarily so. You, the odds are in your favor if you are with that right person. But just like Saul, just like Solomon, just like Israel, it can start off good and end badly because someone decides they're not going to follow the Lord. So there is no guarantee. But let me say this. It does not necessarily mean that you miss God. Because people tend to think, I got married to this person, I sought the Lord. Now I'm talking about all things being equal. All things being equal. You've done your homework. You got godly counsel. You listened to other people. You did everything you knew to do. But if that person decides they're going to go into left field, doesn't mean 
you miss God. It means at some point they chose not to follow God. God chose Solomon to rule over Israel. God chose Saul to rule over Israel. God chose Israel to be his people. But the people, because God has given us free will, they chose not to follow. So did God miss it? It's like, did God miss himself? <laughs> no. We have free will. So I want to say to everyone here and people on Facebook, you may have married somebody, and I've been hearing lately people say, you know, I was married for this long period of time, this long period of time, 17 years, 30 years, and the person divorced, they didn't, miss, they didn't necessarily miss God. Not necessarily. And sometimes I will sit down like, the, the, and what I mean by missing God, let me say this. I tell people all the time, like the couple that came one time, we actually, have, we've got more than one couple. I've known them for a month, and we're, we're going to get married. Or like my friend who called me and said, I've known him for a month, I'm going to get married. I tell people all the time, getting married is not a sin. You can get married, doesn't mean you sin. But it may not be wise. It may not be wise to rush into a marriage, to rush. And the reason, Karen and I talk about this all the time, I go, the reason I ask people to wait, or I pray for people to wait, because if I know you, I don't want you to suffer. I don't want you to be in pain. And we've seen too many of our friends go through hell because they rushed. They were too quick. They didn't wait. I've had some people getting mad at me. They say, well, you don't want me to get married. I say, it's not that I want you to get married. I just want you to wait. I want you to develop a little bit. I want you to give it some time. Because I always tell people, after the great wedding and after the honeymoon comes the marriage. <laughs> and marriage is great if you know how to live in your marriage. And that's why I say, you know, it's, I put on Facebook today, if you hear from God that this is the person, if you hear from God, this is my spouse, you get that specific word, does it mean you will have a great marriage? Nope. Because it's not hearing from God that's going to determine whether or not you have a great marriage. It's what you do in the marriage. Just hearing that this is the one, they actually might be the one. But if you don't live according to the you won't have a great marriage. It's not enough just to hear. It's not enough just to be led. You also have to have wisdom of how to walk in the marriage. That is what gives us a great marriage. So, does God join us together? Does he work to bring us together? Yes, but it's also a human activity. We have to look. We have to be aware. We have to have objective criteria. We need to have people outside of us who can say, uh, you might be moving too fast. You need to wait. One of the things I was thinking about this morning, I would suggest this. If you are a female and you're looking to get married and all your female friends are saying, oh, yeah, girl, he's the one. Go with him. He is the one. I said, great. Go find a godly guy and go talk with him and ask him. And vice versa. If you're a guy and you're marrying a girl and all your friends go, yeah, man, woo, that's great. Go find a godly woman and go talk to her and say, what do you think about this? Get a different perspective. Get a, this is one of the reasons I like to do my marital coaching with young couples with Karen. So we got two different perspectives. There's a male perspective and then there's a female perspective. And we both seek to bring the wisdom of God into the situation. But her perspective is different from mine. And mine is different from hers. So it, it's good to get a different perspective so that you could very possibly hear something different because people are going to look at it a little differently. Does that make sense? It's about wisdom. Finally, godly counsel and wisdom. So God does bring us together. He does lead us. He can speak to us if he so chooses. But just because we get a word, just because we hear something, doesn't mean everything will be perfect. And it doesn't mean everything is guaranteed. Because stuff does happen. But we got a greater chance of having a better marriage if we are walking in wisdom and we are following as much as we know how the leading of the Lord. And let me say one more thing in closing, I'm done. Hearing God, following God, it can be tricky sometimes. Sometimes, it, it, I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's not easy. Trying to discern, trying to hear. I remember one of my mentors, Dr. Dwight Pryor, said that one time. I was like, oh, so glad to hear that. <laughs> Because some people talk about hearing from God, and it was like, oh, yeah, it's easy. It's easy. You just ask God a question, and he just, boom, he speaks. And, you know, it's just, I, 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 when I heard Dwight, I was like, oh, thank you, Dwight. 
Sometimes it's not easy, but this is where you get other people. Usually when I'm sharing with you things, I go like, the Lord said this to me, he said this to me. These are things that I've heard a while ago, and we've already walked out, and it's proven. Yeah, that was God. But there are times I've heard things, and I'm not sure. There are times I've heard things, and I've been wrong. It can be tricky hearing God. But I, be, I, you know, I grew up in the charismatic community. I believe God does speak today. I believe he still ministers to us. And I believe he also provides objective criteria by which we can judge what we're hearing so that we can be brought into a safe place and experience what he really wants for us. Amen? Was that helpful? Did you learn anything today? All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We ask you to lead us, to guide us. For everyone on Facebook who's listening, Lord, I pray for them that you will lead and guide them by your spirit, that they, Father God, will find that person that you do have with them, that you will lead them together, that they will get busy, Lord God, and be active, and that they will just walk and live life as you want them to, and that you will bring them to the person that you have for them, and that they will get the preparation they need to have the type of marriage that you want and that they desire. In Jesus' name. Amen. Facebook, thank you so much. We will see you, Lord willing, next week.